fucking Megalobox. It'd be sleepy time for you right now. Then we've got the ultimate gear list. A street dog wouldn't understand. Hey yo, I'm back. You probably thought I wasn't doing anything while I was going, but I sort of was doing something. Kinda? Nevertheless, that doesn't fucking matter at all. I wanted to come back and talk about Megalobox. I wanted to also do something completely different too when it came to this, because this is going to be a, a bit of a longer video. And I wanted to, one, go over season one in the first part of this video and watch it and then t tell you my thoughts. And then later on in the video, I'll watch season two and I, then that's when I'll actually give out my full thoughts on the whole thing as a whole. So if you hear anything that's a bit contradictory or weird, then that's basically why. Let's just get straight into it. Megalobox itself was a fun trip to go on. Right. Seeing boxes fire right. in the ring, seeing blood, sweat passion seeing people get cte in a matter of seconds with their fucking gear and then hitting him in the head like a damn 50 cal it wasn't really a crazy amount more that i could really ask for but as always let's get into the story first so with the story first starting off with nanbu as well as junkyard dog right now both these characters they basically stage fights or they rig the fight in the sense of taking the fall at some certain round of junk dog right and this is basically needed because nanbu is in debt as well as junk dog wants to continue fighting and actually fight strong opponents but the issue becomes junk dog doesn't want to continue rigging fights he actually wants to fight stronger opponents because he knows he can one punch ko all of these people he wants to fight stronger opponents and basically be, be the best at megalo boxing but in one day when junk dog gets mad he goes on the road and he go, basically goes to the city and when he gets to the city he almost runs over one of the people that's running the megalo box tournament yukiko and she's also accompanied with the world champion who is yuri junk dog almost gets into a fight with yuri on the highway and basically yukiko pulls uh, yuri back and said no don't do this we're not going to do this here now and basically at a later date in time yuri comes back and he's like uh I want to fight you right here in your ring. He beats Junk Dog, and by this point in time, he's like, I'll play you again if you join the uh, Megalo Box and come in my ring and actually want to try to fight me. All right, that's enough for the story. I would definitely want to get her up and get to the positives and negatives as fast as I can. One of the biggest positives I definitely want to give the show is the antagonist, right? Now, there's only two antagonists that I necessarily don't give a fuck about, and they're sort of extremely forgettable, which is IE Lion Man as well as Shark Boy. Feeling like more or less that they're pit stops in the main event, which is th these three antagonists right here. I've decided to ruin him. <sighs> This new fighter that you've been so carefully developing. You don't have the right to talk about who the real deal is. You're the fraud here, Junk Dog. I'm here. I'm in the moment I've lived for. It's like the two of you really are dancing. With Aragaki, Yuri, and Mikio having the most to do with the story as well as being the most easily the most interesting part about this show. First, let's start things out with Mikio. Mikio is really interesting in the story as well as his whole arc in the show. With Mikio, one being the one pit stop for Joe entering Megalonia. Two, the whole arc he goes through with his realization and self-discovery. And three, him just being related to Yukiko and as well as his thought process of like Yukiko stole everything from him in the sense of being head of the company and him just really wanting to get back at her in any way, shape, or form possible. But the thing I want to focus on the most and what I think is the most interesting with Mikio is his arc, right? Because, right, Mikio has like a gear that reads his opponent's movements and that becomes a bit of a staple for him. But at the same time, he gets questioned by the big two of the whole verse, which is obviously Gearless Joe and as well as Yuri in the sense of, is it you fighting or is it the AI? Do you have actual genuine instinct or are you an actual real fighter? And I like this because it sort of gets stuck in his head and it sort of fucks with him to a certain point because he'll even go to the certain degree of being delusional of saying, me and the AI, we're the same person, we're the same thing. Well, whatever he thinks, I think he is part of me, he is me. What the hell do you idiots know? <laughs> Ace's decisions and the ones that I make are the same. You have a problem with that, you jackass? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? But you slowly start to see that the AI sort of sells him in a way, right? And it doesn't necessarily help him in some certain scenarios when he does fight Gearless Joe. And he could have necessarily won if the AI didn't miscalculate it and just necessarily knocked him out. And it's funny because Mikio basically goes through almost like a midlife crisis in a way for a, a few moments of time of like, what am I supposed to do? What am I going to do? I should really fight on my instinct. And he ends up losing because of it but he also has self-realization of maybe i should take a few steps back and really figure out what i truly want to do then there's also yuri i also really like yuri but not as much as the next person i'm going to talk about 
but sticking with yuri yuri is really cool especially for the final antagonist and sort of like the mirror that you sort of have with gearless joe and yuri himself right with them both feeling like they're both beasts in a way and they're chained up in certain different regards like one yuri does feel like unnecessarily a dog when it comes to yukiko and really necessarily falling in her for stuff instead of his but at in the same breath he feels like he's chained up because of like the armor necessarily he has on his body but when that gets released and coinciding with joe and with joe necessarily has his armor break down it feels like chains are being released from these beasts and they finally get a chance to go at it in the ring itself feeling like you're about to see who is the true apex predator when it comes to megalobox then there's also something that yuri has that I also believe joe has the same thing of right and this is just this aura now it comes in two different forms the first form of this aura is just how intimidating he is to certain people and how sort of scary he can really be and the same thing that coincides with the same thing that Joe has is that aura to change people on top of that, right? Where he changes certain people around him and then it just changes them for the better. And then lastly, who I think is easily the best is fucking Aragaki, right? Aragaki's whole arc where he has to go through basically the depths of hell when it comes to him going through war and as well as him losing his legs and for him to basically be abandoned and really feel like he is nothing to a certain degree and point. So much so to the point where he doesn't want to really see GTA 6 and wants to, you know, them. and the reason i really love this so much because it feels like a web of an integrated plot when it comes to him as well as nanbu and joe where we see a whole bunch of characterization when it comes to nanbu and really just see a whole different side of him that you don't really get to see because realistically he's a sleazy piece of shit but we really necessarily see that softer side of him or side before the side that he is right now here and now but both of them necessarily feel like they're at fault for actions that are realistically out of both of their hands and really just seeing how far nan will really go for his revenge one and two seeing his beautiful realization and his beautiful resolution that he comes with in his mind of saying that it's, it's not really your fault and i'm sorry but i do also love you and there's also something that does coexist with this right is the fucking imagery that is the second thing i love and i think is one of the higher things in this show the imagery is highly everywhere like i said before with joe and his armor falling apart as well as yuri and taking his armor off and then there's also with aragaki and him just seeing a little butterfly in the sky when he's about to lose his legs which can be seen and used as his new lease on life or his new change on life so much to the point where he has to tattoo it on his body but that is another thing i really do love about this show is just the symbolism now some of it is a little bit on the nose but most of it i do really enjoy and really do like now moving on to the next big three which would obviously be gearless joe as well as nanbu and sachio now i do want to start off with sachio because i do think he is the weakest link in the group but i still like him for who he is and what he serves as the purpose for everyone in the story itself right so i do like sacho because we do get a little bit in depth with his backstory at least with his parents and sort of his positioning of why he's such a tech genius right because his father was like a genius as well as he worked on some of the technology that is in yukio's company and we realistically get more of that background but i feel like i really want more with sacho but like I said before, I do like for what he is and the purpose he serves as one, being like the tech genius of the group, but two, also being the glue for Team Nowhere, right? When things get tough or things get rough, he sort of like comes out, even if he has to come out swinging or screaming and yelling to these people like, this is the right solution. Come on, guys, we can figure this out, right? This is the biggest gamble of your life, huh? What a joke. We'll never make it into Megalonia like this, you fat phony. You're just like those jerks out there yelling. Joe's on that mat risking his life and all you're doing is complaining. And you're no better either, Joe. You really think you can do everything on your own? That's what I'm talking about. This shit means something to me, man. Then there's Namu, who's genuinely a piece of fucking garbage for like the most part, right? And you can sort of see where there are times in, in him where he genuinely wants to be that good person, where he, he knows what the right decision is or the right thing to do. And that sometimes shines out of him here and there. But for the most part, on the outside, he just gives out either piece of shit statements. He does give out good advice here and there to Joe on what to do for fighting, as well as what is sort of the right conditioning of how you should fight. But then there's other times when he's doubting the situation or doubting Joe, as well as just telling him what to necessarily do in the worst way possible. Especially when you put into account him getting fucked over so many times by fucking Nanbu. And realistically, the comparison that he gets to being a scorpion so many times, almost to the point where they, well, not said almost, but really to the point of them telling the story where it comes to the scorpion 
a frog and as you all know when the scorpion asks the frog can i please cross the river i need to cross the river he's like no you're gonna sting me and the scorpion says i promise i won't sting you but midway through he stings him and he says why we're both gonna die he's like i'm sorry it's in my nature but it's a beautiful thing to see where you do actually see nanbu actually twist his way and really necessarily become that great good person that he knows he is inside and really necessarily help joe to any degree possible whether it be taking away his eye or even his heart and necessarily killing himself just for joe so you can see joe get to megalomania and it just feels like once he loses that eye he necessarily almost becomes I don't, I don't want to say a completely different person or a changed man. Well, yeah, I would say changed man. I think that is the best course of action to say. He really changes into someone who he's really proud of as well as, and stoic. Well, I don't know, maybe it's because he's double blinded now, but <laughs> he feels really stoic as well as just like that old man that you go to for advice or that old man that definitely help you in any way, shape or form possible. Then the final man, obviously Joe himself. Now, like I said before, Joe Duffy has like an aura around him when it comes to changing people, everyone that he has fall into a certain degree that they changed their way in life almost like yuri and him just meeting him in general making made him actually want to change his full dream in general just to fight him one more time and joe just really feeling like a actual average joe no pun intended when it comes to him just necessarily want to fight stronger people as well as him wanting to necessarily be the best in megaloboxing and just seeing his passion and drive whenever he gets into the ring or when he knows he's gonna fight a strong opponent is just almost electrifying to a certain degree and point but just like sacho i think they fall in the same category like I want more from Joe. I want more from Sacho. I want to low-key know who they are as a person. I want to know more of that. I want to know what they would do in certain more stickier or worse situations or word for wear. Then there's the fights. I do really like the fights in the show because they get into extremely sticky situations of how either they're going to fight this person or the surrounding events around the fight that may alter the fight itself that they have to go through and navigate. And it's really interesting and cool to see how they're going to navigate it or what they're necessarily going to do next and then on top of that when they get hit or when they hit the floor the imagery looks fucking phenomenal it definitely looks like he's dead or some shit on the floor he just literally got killed i remember there's one line in the show where he literally says okay i swear i'm not delusional but i can't find a clip where he goes like oh my goodness like he's been shot like when he gets punched in the face or something like that but i cannot find it so if anyone could find it for me in the comment section i'll be extremely grateful back to the video and that generally had me on the floor dying that show was hilarious then the last thing I want to go over with this season is the soundtrack. The soundtrack was fuego. There was so many OSTs that I loved. And then there were also a few parts where they were rapping in Japanese. And I thought that was pretty cool too. They really necessarily knew how to hype you up for a fight when we're about to get really into it. But other than that, on to season two. It hurts. The pain. The voices. Holy shit. Be careful what you wish for. I got exactly what I wanted. Mm. Who writes this stuff? Talk about a fucking upgrade from the last season. God damn, that's all I can say really realistically. It's, it's that good, honestly. To quickly say what a season kicks off with is with Joe and he's really being nomadic and when he's traveling to other locations and he's wearing gear and he's fighting other opponents. Now that's all I'll say for the story because honestly, I just want to keep as less as possible but my goodness gracious the prequel arc that we get the first four episodes is genuinely phenomenal and i don't think i've ever wanted to go through a fucking tv screen and actually choke a child more than i wanted to in this arc okay, your lies. Oh, the prequel arc generally feels like what they did with aragaki and i how many compliments i genuinely gave the show when they came to despair and how really far down that they really love showing how people can go they do that shit with joe and it's fucking phenomenal but also keep in mind incredibly sad we seeing him be realistically an addict and him just like genuinely even pick up pills off the floor and just like shove them down his throat but seeing joe go from below zero to becoming the hero that he once was was a beautiful fucking start to it and the prequel arc really sets up for joe in this season of what he has to do which is pay back the people he owes before I get off the prequel arc, the most beautiful best character in that arc is fucking Chief. The man himself generally went from the bowels of hell and crawled himself all the way out, just like how Joe's attempting to, and realistically continue to move forward with his life and try to help out others because he's seen how bad it can necessarily get. Even though people sometimes will call him out or sometimes people will make fun of him or curse him out or say something extremely disrespectful, but he's been on that journey before and he understands the journey of life so he goes with feeling extremely stoic in that way and my goodness gracious did they actually handle grief completely well i really loved how they handled grief throughout a whole bunch of avenues of characters like for example joe and his 
path of self-destruction whether it be through drugs as well as to be through fighting and abuse and then spiraling down a rabbit hole that not many few get out of or Shachio who's trying to genuinely grab onto the moment of the past and bring it to his present and make it be his present even though it's unattainable and ungrabbable one having the inability to move forward and two attempting to be someone else that you aren't then there's Yuri who falls in line with the grief sentiment as well with his star pupil being completely decimated and destroyed by Mac making him almost rethink everything he's done with megaloboxing and the dangerous sport that he certainly plays a part of but having completely beautiful ways that all these characters deal with grief like for example joe how he attends to atone for everything he has done even if he can't find forgiveness in the people that he was with at a certain point in time or Sachio, who necessarily doesn't forgive Joe for what he's done, but he wants to move forward. He doesn't want to keep staying in this past. He's already spent his life wasting his time and being at this point in life for way too long. And even Yuri coming to the conclusion that it's not his fault and this is just the nature, one, the nature of the sport, and two, having the conversation with the person that he has affected really helped him understand, like, okay, I get it. Like, this isn't really my fault. I should continue on with, with what I'm doing. But quickly going back to the prequel arc, the last thing I forgot to say was like i also really appreciate how unforced like the situation was with the immigrants as well as the people that were on the land and how specifically the storytelling there but realistically the storytelling as a whole is fucking top notch feeling like they completely improved since the first season because in the first season i feel like the best part of the show is the characters and the plot sometimes comes secondary even third at certain points of time but everything it feels like it's top notch or this kicked up to 11 and the fights were pretty top notch and pretty violent and the thing is with the fights you felt like you didn't really necessarily know what was going to happen because they felt that violent at least in my opinion where like you can probably say okay you think this is going to happen but the fight gets really intense and really hard to see like oh what is actually going to happen you're like okay you start to second guess yourself to a certain point and at the same time i give praise to the fights but it feels like the fights go on the back burner for the emotions to be in the complete forefront of the whole show itself and having all this characterization and characters interact in one of the most best time skips i've seen in a while then they double down with the storytelling again ever since the first season where you have the scorpion and the toad like i expressed before but instead now we have this mockingbird story and how it deeply intersects and connects with basically most of the characters in the show but mainly mac as well as joe and sachio and it's said so many times in this story it makes it feel like it's trying to instate into you or understand the situation as at hand with all these characters then there's also mac who's sort of the, one of the main antagonists in the show by the time we get to the end of it and for him it feels very sad because it feels like the revelation or realization that everything you've been doing is has been a lot up to a certain point having him second guess and regret a whole bunch of choices in his life and in the end having him contemplate to himself was it really necessarily worth it in the end and something that also connects to him but also joe at the same time is the concept of dreams themselves right and how if you don't stop dreaming sometimes at certain points that you can actually ruin what is in front of you then and there with joe in his panic thinking he knows what is best for the group and continuing to fight ends up making him lose them in the end or with mac and how mac necessarily gets completely lost in the sauce and doesn't necessarily realize that he's actually being used as a complete and utter pawn all the way up until the end when it came to him having surgeries or him having the extra power of boost of beating these people not really remembering but as long as he got to face joe none of it mattered but my goodness gracious this was such a fun and utter just excellent trip that i went on with megalobox i've seen the first season before but when it came to the second season my god i never seen it and it took me a few years to get to it but i'm really happy i did always i always suggest it i would suggest that pretty much anybody but other than that thank you guys for watching like comment subscribe i'll see you guys in the next one goodbye